Please stand and face the back of the sanctuary. Christ is risen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand is lifted high. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. I will not die but live. And will proclaim what the Lord has done. Open for me the gates of the righteous. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. I will give you thanks for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our hearts. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad. Alleluia! Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia! Let us pray. Almighty God, by the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, you conquered death and opened the gate to eternal life. 
Grant that we who have been raised with him through baptism may walk in newness of life and ever rejoice in the hope of sharing his glory. We pray this through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be dominion and praise now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. The children will now sing.
Our first reading for this Easter tide is recorded for us in the book of God's servant, Job, words that are very familiar to us and so very treasured by us. These words also serve as a basis for our sermon this morning. Job chapter 19. Oh, that my words were recorded, that they were written on a scroll, that they were inscribed with an iron tool on lead or engraved in rock forever. I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand on the earth. After my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes, I and not another, how my heart yearns within me. The word of the Lord. In our second reading this morning, we turn to the Apostle Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, reading from chapter 15, that great resurrection chapter, where Christ gives us hope in this life. And more than that, Christ's resurrection gives us hope for the eternal life that is to come. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are, of all people, most to be pitied. 
But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive, but each in turn, Christ the firstfruits. Then when he comes, those who belong to him, then the end will come. When he hands over the kingdom to, the, to God the Father, after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. the morning, an angel explains to the women why they won't find Jesus' corpse in the tomb. The Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 16. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him? But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Please be seated.
Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Amen. Our text this Easter day for today's sermon from Job chapter 19, the first reading for today. Dear fellow believers in Christ our risen Savior, you will see him in Galilee. That's what the angels said at the empty tomb of Jesus to those women. And this was a miracle unlike any they had seen, these women. Jesus had walked on water. He had healed sick people. He had even raised the dead. But three days previous, Jesus himself had died. The angel was saying he was back from the dead. They would see him. Centuries earlier, a believer named Job spoke of this miracle, knew of this miracle. He said, I know that my Redeemer lives. But Job also knew about another miracle attached to that miracle. Job said, after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. After he died, his body, Job's body, would be raised too. This is the double good news that brings us here today. Christ is risen from the dead, we too will rise as Jesus himself promised, because I live, you too shall live. Job's heart yearned for that Redeemer and that day of resurrection. Job needed all the help he could get. You might know a bit about Job's history. He was a believer in ancient Old Testament times, He had been a man of great wealth with a large family and then one day his world came crashing down. Enemies had attacked and killed his servants. They had taken and stolen his livestock. All his wealth was gone in a moment. Then a storm struck the house where his children were staying and all of them died in that storm. His family was gone. And in his grief and in his shock, Job remained faithful and trusting. He said, the Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And then things got worse. In poverty and in grief, Job is struck with sores covering his body. Painful sores that wouldn't go away. And as time dragged on, Job remained a believer. But the question insurmountable question began to plague him, one that he couldn't answer. Why, Lord? Why so much suffering? Isn't that the question that comes to our mind too? A little bit of suffering, we're used to that, but when it gets heavy, even if it doesn't affect us personally, just that it happens in the world leads us to ask why. Why did that shooter Open fire on a crowd of innocent people. And why does it keep happening, Lord? Why tsunamis and hurricanes? Horrible traffic accidents. Why so much senseless violence and and untimely death? Why, Lord? The Lord doesn't offer an explanation for particular suffering coming to Job. At the end of the book, the Lord makes it clear to Job, this is for the Lord to know, and Job can't know. It's almost as if the Lord is saying, this is how things are in this world now. The Lord is saying that to us, and we can't help but be reminded that it was not always like this in this world. We can't help but be reminded that when God created the world, there was, no, there was no tragedy, there were no suffering people, there was no death at all. And we can't help but be reminded of when and why that changed. When Adam and Eve sinned, when they rebelled against God, all of nature, all of this world, all of the people of this world to come lost their perfection too. Suffering and death became par for the course. This still doesn't explain to us exactly why a particular piece of suffering may come to us, but it does tell us why there is suffering at all. It's because of sin. 
And no matter how bad the suffering is, it's connected to that same spiritual problem. Sin is the issue. That is how bad sin is. We might think sin isn't quite so bad, even if we've said a a word that hurts somebody, a careless, thoughtless word, or done something that hurts somebody, don't we try to think of how we are innocent in it? We had a good reason for what we said. They're the ones with the problem. We lose sight often, don't we, of how self-centered we can be and the damage that causes to the people around us. Maybe they stay quiet about it and don't say anything. But it's always happening. And in case we miss just how our sin affects the people around us, the evidence of our sin and how bad it is exists in another form. It's there in all of the suffering, in all of the death of this world. Look at that. And then you can understand what is so wrong with you and me. When we suffer, we may say, why, Lord, why is this happening? But might the Lord also ask us a similar question, why? Why do we sin? The Lord blesses us so richly with everything that we need. So then, why do we so easily turn from him and follow our own path? Why do we let his promises Stay on the back burner and not think of them. Why do we fail to trust him? Why do we worry? We can't offer an explanation to God, nor do we have an excuse for our sins. Whatever suffering it is we have to endure in this world, it can't compare, can it, to the suffering we deserve to come our way in eternity. But in the midst of all of this, In today's reading, we hear Job, the one struggling to know why. We hear Job cry out, I know that my Redeemer lives. That promise that he had received from the Lord brought him supreme comfort. Job knew that a Savior was coming, the Son of God. And he would come into this world full of people who are so lost they don't even know they're lost. A world full of people who are suffering and who are crying out, Why, Lord? And what would he come to do? Would he come to offer an explanation to everybody why this particular suffering has come their way? Would that even help? No, he doesn't come with explanations. He comes to pay. He comes to redeem And he pays with his own life. Can we just pause and think about that for for just a moment? That God would pay for something at all. He's God. Why is God paying for something? And are we valuable? If you and I had amazing athletic ability, we might be valuable to some team owner somewhere, but not to the Lord. The wages of sin is death. That's the value that we bring. That's what the Lord should pay us. Those are our wages. But instead, he pays to have us. And what he pays for us is such an astonishing payment. Our mouths are just left open in amazement. He pays with the blood of his own son, Jesus, the Lamb of God, goes to his cross and pays for the sins of the world. And then, by his glorious resurrection from the dead, makes it crystal clear that the payment is complete. It's acceptable to God. Every last sin of every last sinner has been paid for. God himself paid it in our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Fellow believers, you are redeemed. Do you know the the good feeling of having a debt paid off? Have any of you paid off your mortgage? No more monthly payments left for you. What a relief. If it hasn't happened and you have a mortgage, you're waiting for that day. That's nothing compared to this payment the Lord has made for you. All of your sins are paid for before God who rules everything. That means you're free from guilt, free from punishment. You can serve other people 
in your life without guilt driving you along, without something to prove, you're redeemed. I know that my Redeemer lives, said Job. And he knew what else that good news meant. Even after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I and not another, how my heart yearns within me. From the depths of his suffering, he looks forward to that day. The day that you and I die, fellow believers, our soul goes to heaven. And it's a glorious day. But there is a yet more glorious day to come. There is a day when every body of every person will be raised and every believer's body will go to be with the Lord in heaven. You and I might have sort of a low opinion about our bodies. When we think about our bodies, we might first of all think about the things that are wrong with our bodies. Things come to mind like headaches, indigestion, insomnia, high blood pressure, aching joints. The list goes on and on of all the things that might bother us about our bodies. We might not like how our bodies look. If we have a low opinion about our bodies, there are plenty of people in our world who would support us in that thinking. Don't like the gender of your body, they would say. Then, in your mind, come up with your own idea of what your gender should be. Your body doesn't matter, they say. If your quality of life in your body is so bad, you can hardly stand it. You wonder why you're still here, you wish... You were done. There are people in our world who would support you in that path and say, you know, maybe you should find a doctor who can assist you with that and that would be a brave thing for you to do, they would say. But see how high the Lord's opinion is of your body and mine. It's not only that he has created each one of us, that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, that he knit us together in our mother's wombs. It's that when he came to save us, the Son of God assumed a human body just like yours and mine. To save us, body and soul. When he went to his cross, nails and thorns pierced his body just as sins of the world weighed on his soul. To save us, body and soul. In Holy Communion, he comes to us and gives us his flesh and blood Along with the forgiveness of sins, healing and help for souls and bodies that will be with him forever in heaven. The day is coming, fellow believers, when we will be raised and glorified. In your flesh you will see God and it will be a flesh without any illness or pain or disability. And with your eyes, you will see God and there will be no stigmatism or low vision getting in the way of that. And your mind will grasp the joy of the moment without any chemical imbalance sort of preventing it. And arms free of aching joints will be able to embrace the Savior who died and rose for you How our hearts yearn within us. How our hearts yearn within us when when suffering and death comes near to us. When someone that we love, a fellow believer, is taken from us in death. Everything looks so final, doesn't it? Ashes in an urn, a mound of dirt in a cemetery. It looks like that's it now. But it's temporary Our Redeemer lives even after our skin has been destroyed, yet in our flesh we will see God and we will see our fellow believer too. How our hearts yearn within us when suffering comes into our life. What are you dealing with right now? Something. We all are. Grief that won't lessen. Pain that won't go away. Depression that clings. We all have something. And we don't have easy answers to the question why particular suffering come to each of us. 
But in the middle of his suffering, Job cried out, I know that my Redeemer lives. The suffering that we endure in this life cannot compare with the glory that will be revealed in us. And you can say what Job said. When tragedy strikes, my Redeemer lives. Even in the middle of grief, my Redeemer lives. When death is approaching you and me, my Redeemer lives. So say it. Job says, Oh, that my words were recorded, that they were written on a scroll, that they were inscribed with an iron tool on lead, engraved in rock forever. Do you suppose that on Job's headstone or marker, somebody did engrave these words? The friends who heard him say this? Possibly. Better than that, though. Job's words have been recorded in the Word of God, which will stand for all eternity. And that word is for you here today, right now. Your death in this world is not the end. For you, it is now the pathway to eternal life. No death in hell will certainly ever come to you. You are on your way home to heaven. Your Redeemer lives Whatever else you are going through right now, that glorious good news is the one most important thing that overshadows all else. Your Redeemer lives. Sin is conquered. And death's days are numbered. Amen. Please stand. And the peace of God that surpasses All understanding will guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. On page 8, you find our confession of faith. I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord. He has redeemed me, a lost and condemned creature, purchased and won evil from all sins, from death and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy precious blood and with his innocent suffering and death. All this he did that I should be his own and live under him in his kingdom and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness just as he has risen from death and lives and rules eternally. This is most certainly true. Please be seated.
Almighty and merciful God, on this glorious day, we rejoice in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Increase our faith that the message of the empty tomb may fill our lives and make us glad each day. We may have confidence that Jesus has taken us from death to life. King of kings and Lord of lords, destroy all powers that stand against you, seen or unseen. When evil exerts itself against your saving will, Rule it for the sake of the gospel's free course. And for our church to fight the good fight to the end. Never leave us or forsake us. Walk among our churches, O living one, as the faithful witness and firstborn from the dead. As you send faithful women with news of your resurrection, may all the faithful proclaim, He is risen. Remove the sting of death from all who mourn. In moments of grief, call believers through the voice of our Good Shepherd and embolden us to follow his promises. Hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence. O Lord of life, you have done mighty things for us. We pray through him who is the beginning and the end, Jesus Christ our Lord. His name is above every name, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Please stand. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who by his willing sacrifice on the cross took away the sins of the world and by his glorious resurrection, restored everlasting life. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. 
Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink of it in remembrance of me. And the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you always. Amen.
And now this true body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, it will strengthen and preserve you in the one true faith to life everlasting. Go, in Christ's peace, your sins are forgiven. Amen. Please stand. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. I will not die, but live. And will proclaim what the Lord has done. We give you thanks, O Lord, for the foretaste of the heavenly banquet that you have given us to eat and to drink in this sacrament. Through this gift, you have fed our faith, nourished our hope, and strengthened our love. Almighty God, with renewed joy, we have celebrated the festival of our Lord's resurrection. Grant us continued joy, peace, and rest to all in Christ Jesus our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Please remain standing for our closing hymn on the following page. Please be seated. What a great joy it was to be in God's house with you this Easter day. And we rejoice in the one who is risen, who has risen indeed, and we shout our praises of Alleluia to our King. Welcome all our guests who are with us today. We're so glad you chose to worship with us, whether it was because of invitation of a friend or family or maybe a complete stranger. We're very glad to have you here today. 
Whether you're a first-time guest with us though this morning or a lifetime member, if you haven't done so already, please fill out that friendship register. It's in that little black booklet on the end of the pew at the middle aisle. You have some time to do that. A few things before we depart this morning. There is a meal provided for you downstairs. Even if you didn't bring something, that's okay. And we'll pray over that meal here in just a moment. But a reminder for these meals, do not go down this first stairwell that goes out the old wooden church door. If you want to go downstairs for the meal, please go halfway down the hall to that middle stairwell and down there and then we'll be able to get in line and get food together. May the Lord bless and keep each one of you. A reminder also, this Wednesday, we go back to our normal first Wednesday of the month prayer at the close of day. This Wednesday, 7.30, and we'll be taking a look at the disciples who were on that road to Emmaus that Jesus met. And our theme this, that evening will be, stay with us. That prayer of the disciples, the prayer that our Lord answers every single day. The Lord bless you this day and the rest of your Easter celebrations. But before we depart, a reminder, please fellowship with one another. Enjoy each other's company. Pastor Isabel and I will greet you in the back. But before we go, let's join together in the common table prayer. Come, Lord Jesus, be our guest, and let these gifts to us be blessed. O oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Amen.